Hello, everyone. I'm Kamran. And I'm Billy. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors. As if there's two other digressors as professional out there. Are you saying that other digressors are unprofessional or that there are no other digressors that are professional? As professional. As professional. Okay. <laughs> Nearly as professional at digressing as we are. I understand. Today, we will be discussing Book 1, Chapter 2 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Book of the Fallen. This is Part 2 of our coverage of this chapter. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it's most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Just know that Comron and I know that this series is the best fantasy story ever written, and we're approaching this from a purely fanboy point of view. No literary critique of Erickson, that is. <laughs> we'll be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that haven't read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of the respective book. A quick warning, today's episode contains descriptions of extreme violence and it is not recommended for children. Our show is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate it. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon Weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you, and so send any feedback or comments that you have to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. All right, Chapter 2, Part 2. Since leaving Darujistan eight weeks past, Quick Ben had been attached to second in command Whiskey Jack's staff with the task of assisting in the consolidation of Dujak's rebel army. He had been busy weaving a network of communications through Pale and its outlying approaches, tithes and tariffs in answer to the army's financial needs, and the imposition of control, easing the transition from occupation to possession. He thought, at least for the moment. One Arm's host and the Malazan Empire had parted ways, after all. Yet, Quick Ben had wondered more than once at the curiously imperial responsibilities he had been tasked to complete. He thought, outlaws, are we? Indeed, and Hood dreams of sheep gambolling in green pastures, too. Dujek was waiting. Caladan Brood's army had taken his time coming south and had only the day before reached the plain north of Pale. Tist Andy at its heart with mercenaries and Ilgress Bargast on one flank, and the Reavy and their massive veteran herds on the other. But there would be no war, not this time. He thought, no, by the abyss. We've all decided to fight a new enemy, assuming the parlay goes smoothly. And given that Darujistan's rulers are already negotiating with us, that seems likely. A new enemy. Some theocratic empire devouring city after city in a seemingly unstoppable wave of fanatic ferocity. The Panyan Domin. Why do I have a bad feeling about this? Never mind. It's time to find my wayward tracker. That's the first bit of detail about what category of empire the Panyan Domin falls into. A theocratic empire breeds a certain ferocity unmatched by others. This is true, and I agree. It, does, it can definitely breed that kind of ferocity. Eyes closing, Quick Ben loosed his soul's chains and slipped away from his body. For the moment, he could sense nothing of the pebble, so he had little choice but to search in an outward spiral, trusting in proximity to brush his senses sooner or later. It meant proceeding blind, and if there was one thing he hated, he thought, Ah, found you! Surprisingly close, as if he'd crossed some kind of hidden barrier. His vision showed him nothing but darkness, not a single star visible overhead, but beneath him the ground had leveled out. He thought, I'm into a warren all right. What's alarming is, I don't quite recognize it. Familiar, but wrong. He discerned a faint reddish glow ahead, rising from the ground. It coincided with the location of his tracker. The smell of sweet smoke was in the air. Quick Ben's unease deepened, but he approached the glow nonetheless. The red light bled from a ragged tent, he now saw. A hide flap covered the entrance, but it hung untied. He sensed nothing of what lay within. He reached the tent, crouched down, then hesitated. He thought, Curiosity is my greatest curse, but simple acknowledgement of a flaw does not correct it. Alas. He drew the flap aside and looked inside. A blanket-wrapped figure sat huddled against the tent's far wall, less than three paces away, leaning over a brazier from which smoke rose in sinuous coils. Its breathing was loud, labored. A hand that appeared to have had every one of its bones broken lifted into view and gestured. A voice rasped from beneath the hooded blanket. Enter, mage. I believe I have something of yours. Quick Ben accessed his warrens. He could only manage seven at any one time, though he possessed more. Power rippled through him in waves. He did so with reluctance. To unveil simultaneously nearly all he possessed filled him with a delicious whisper of omnipotence. 
yet he knew that sensation for the dangerous, potentially fatal illusion it was. Seven at one time, though he possessed more? <laughs> I thought he only had seven total. That's what I was thinking, too. That's exactly what I thought. I'm just like, holy smokes. Is that something he does regularly? I think so. Does he consume other people in this suit? You know, and consume him, I'm guessing. This is what I'm thinking now. All of a sudden, I'm like, huh, more? We've heard mentioned that he weaves them together. When he was doing the soul shifting ritual with Hairlock, I believe it was mentioned. And this is two years ago. So Ugh. I don't remember now. if it was specifically this, but. I think it was because Tattersell mentioned that she recognized flavors of the Warren. That's right. He was twisting it with other ones. Yeah. The main thing I remember about that encounter is that he was someone she should have known. And I was like, whoa. Yes. She was how old? A couple hundred years old? Yeah, a couple hundred, I think. Just barely 210 or so. I thought it was over 200. I think it's over two. For her to have been around that long, she would probably know the majority of the prominent high mages in the area. Yes. I didn't even think about it like that until just now. Nicely puts her. No, thank you. <laughs> he eluded being spotted from her his whole life. I'm sorry, as from what we know of his man's life. Granted, he was in seven cities. I don't know if she yeah. ever traveled there, but that's true. Word travels when people are this powerful, mm -hmm. especially since the Malazans had conquered seven cities. You would think that she would know mages that are that powerful yeah the figure continued between wheezing gasps you realize now that you must retrieve it for one such as myself to hold such a link to your admirable powers mortal quick ben asked who are you the figure said broken shattered chained to this fevered corpse beneath us i did not ask for such a fate i was not always a thing of pain quick ben pressed a hand to the earth outside the tent quested with his powers after a long moment, his eyes widened, then slowly closed. He said, you have infected her. The figure said, in this realm, I am as a cancer, and with each passing of light, I grow yet more virulent. She cannot awaken whilst I burgeon in her flesh. So that was something that I didn't remember, that Burn cannot wake up as long as he's chained in place. And I wonder what would happen if she did wake up. Well, this brings up some curiosity with Burn in particular. When did Burn come into place? Because we know his sleep has only been for what? 2000-ish? Her. Her sleep has been, we've noticed it at the beginning of the books. Uh, not but not these past couple books have not really said too many about Burn's sleep, but Burn's been asleep for like 1900 years or something like that. We are up to 1164 Burn's sleep. 11. So not particularly long ago compared to like the chaining of the god, the crippled god, which was couple hundred thousand years back with the beginning of this book the first chaining yes when he was called down by mages within calor's kingdom yes so what was life like before she was chained aside from the pulling alien gods willingly into this plane i mean was it just kind of like was it unstable or you know, did her presence provide stability that's a good question Maybe the continents were moving around more. You probably had more volcanic activity. I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it could be one or the other. I mean, it could either be more active or her, or the presence would keep it soothed. Mm -hmm. Maybe things are getting bad in the earth because she is, in fact, asleep right now and can't do anything to defend herself, maybe. I got no idea. I'm just curious. Because right, other than her, her being chained, I know that we deal with her quite a bit in this book, but I don't think we'll learn much about her. <laughs> maybe the infection wasn't, that bad until relatively recently maybe. he was chained in place but maybe he didn't have the same effect that he's having now maybe due to the burgeoning and the growth of a lot of people bringing a lot more magic in place is making it worse i mean just as a whole more people on the planet and I, I, who knows i got no idea. i'm curious though very curious bunch of new questions i never think about until i get with you <laughs> right that's actually a good question though the figure shifted slightly, and from beneath the folds of filthy blanket came the rustle of heavy chain. He said, Your gods have bound me, mortal, and think the task complete. Quick Ben said, You wish a service in exchange for my tracker. The figure said, Indeed, if I must suffer, then so too must the gods in their world. Quick Ben unleashed his host of warrens. Power ripped through the tent. The figure shrieked, jerking backward. The blanket burst into flame, as did the creature's long, tangled hair. Quick Ben darted into the tent behind the last wave of his sorcery. One hand flashed out, angled down at the wrist, palm up. His fingertips jabbed into the figure's eye sockets, his palms slamming into his forehead, snapping the head back. 
Quick Ben's other hand reached out and unerringly scooped up the pebble as it rolled amidst the rushes. The power of the Warrens winked out. Even as Quick Ben pulled back, pivoted, and dived for the entrance, the chained creature bellowed with rage. Quick Ben scrambled to his feet and ran. The wave struck him from behind, sent him sprawling onto the hot, steaming ground. Screaming, he writhed beneath the sorceress onslaught. He tried to pull himself further away, but the power was too great. It began dragging him back. He clawed at the ground, stared at the furrows his fingers gouged in the earth, saw the dark blood welling from them. He thought, oh, burn, forgive me. The invisible, implacable grip pulled him closer to the tent entrance. Hunger and rage radiated from the figure within, as well as a certainty that such desires were moments from deliverance. Quick Ben was helpless. The god roared, you will know such pain! <sighs> Something reached up through the earth then. A massive hand closed about Quick Ben, like a giant child snatching at a doll. He screamed again as it pulled him down into the churning, steaming soil. His mouth filled with bitter earth. A bellow of fury echoed dimly from above. Jagged rocks ripped along his body as he was pulled further down through the flesh of the sleeping goddess. Starved for air, darkness slowly closed around his mind. Then he was coughing, spitting up mouthfuls of gritty mud. Warm, sweet air filled his lungs. He clawed dirt from his eyes, rolled onto his side. Echoing groans buffeted him, the flat, hard ground beneath him slowly buckling and shifting. Quick Ben rose to his hands and knees. Blood dripped from his soul's torn flesh. His clothes were not but strips, but he was alive. He looked up and almost cried out. Before we get into this next part, I'd like to take a moment to recognize the pure audacity of what Quick Ben just did when he attacked the crippled god. Yeah. He attacked a god. Yeah. <laughs> he got slapped for it a bit. But still, very impressive. He left impressive in the rearview mirror on that one. Dude, is this the first time we've ever really kind of seen him just really... That's when he kind of did the... He dropped the smart bomb. It was... <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. An old Defender reference. I'm sorry. Did you ever play Defender? No. Oh, my good gracious. Do you remember this? In old video games in the arcade, you always had some smart bombs. It was like you got one or two a level occasionally. And it would kind of like nuke close enemies to you. <laughs> It was like you blew it all at once. There was your whole thing. That was everything you got. Plus, you, you had your regular guns, but Quick Ben just dropped everything he had. <laughs> this reminds me a bit of how Kalam is similarly audacious in going through Malice City, fighting through all the claw, yeah, and reaching a little bit above where he probably should on his own. Yes. Getting outside of his limits to the point where he needs help. So yes. in that case, Manala came and helped him. In this case, if Quick Ben didn't get help from whatever pulled him down, yes. Yes. he would have got it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Most assuredly. I am just, yeah, what a great scene there. And then on top of that, the fact, what about the physical attack? Not just the magic attack. Poking his eyeballs and Poking cracking them on the forehead. Yeah, yes. <laughs> what about and that? insult to injury. Yes. I mean, that's The poor guy's hands are mangled. Yeah. I imagine all of his body yes. is Entire broken feet. and healed incorrectly. Terrible yes. imagery. Yes. And it just gouges his eyes out almost. So he's got to probably grow some more. <laughs> Oh, it smacks him in the forehead, steals the rock. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. That's yeah. absolutely amazing. Seeing the crippled god's reaction, how powerful he was in his broken state should be eye-opening. Mm, agreed. And then finally, the nightmare of getting pulled through the earth straight out of a zombie movie. Oh, yeah. Hands pulling you down into the dirt. The other funny thing is, is that he pointed out something here about the, you know, this is still all while he's in his physical body and this is all in the, in the other plane like he's just tethered to his body you know this is happening in elsewhere right his soul has left his body for this trip yes and i, I think this is why i brought up what we we're talking about before the, about legion there's a lot of that going on a lot of this mind fighting that's what's real and the altering of reality and what's you know that's really gets real trippy with that and that, that's what gets really good here it's like whoa yeah that thing is so powerful to grab ben like that it's like you're right he was just going to eat that boy like a just like a dinner roll <laughs> <laughs> he was mad he's mad it should be i mean and yes. like you said insult to injury it's like yeah a vaguely human-shaped figure towered over Quick Ben, easily 15 times his height, its bulk nearly reaching the cavern's dome ceiling. 
Dark flesh of clay studded with rough diamonds gleamed and glittered as the apparition shifted slightly. It seemed to be ignoring Quick Ben, though he knew that it had been this beast that had saved him from the crippled god. Its arms were raised to the ceiling directly above it, hands disappearing into the murky red-stained roof. Vast arcs of dull white gleamed in that ceiling, evenly spaced like an endless succession of ribs. The hands appeared to be gripping or possibly were fused to two such ribs. Just visible beyond the creature, perhaps a thousand paces down the cavern's length, squatted another such apparition, its arms upraised as well. This image is a core memory for me. Such powerful visuals with these entities holding up the bones of the earth. And when I think of this book, this is one of the main images that pops into my mind. Yeah, I think I'm with you. It's not just that. It's this the core memory for me starts with quick entering that tent. <laughs> Getting into that kerfuffle and ending here. This whole scene is such a big, it's so important. It's such a, They're both such important things and such important themes introduced to the, I mean, these are massive themes introduced that are, will pursue us for the rest of this series. Am I right? Hold that thought. Okay. The imagery of this endless tunnel with these entities holding it up. I've been playing Elden Ring lately, and mm -hmm. it's so similar to a lot of the imagery oh. that they have in that game. It would fit right in with that. I see that in so many things I play lately and see. Every time I watch stuff, I think that's why I asked you if you ever watched that third Star Wars movie. There was some stuff that went on down there that I don't care what people said. I had this hardcore, like some Erickson flashbacks and some of this stuff. I mean, massive. <laughs> so that would be The Rise of Skywalker? Yes. Uh-huh. Actually, I still haven't seen that. Can you believe that? I can. I can. I saw this stuff after it had come out. I wasn't waiting any length of time. So I don't have, I liked it. Now, I know I'm probably just, y'all can hate on me, I guess. I mean, but I certainly liked it a lot better than the stuff that has been coming out from Disney lately in the Star Wars universe. So I've not even tried. <laughs> mm. I've heard such bad stuff about this stuff. I'm not even going to turn it on kind of deal. I'll tell you what, Billy. The best content has been all the stuff surrounding it. <laughs> it's so good. What do you mean? Example. Uh, it's the people that are doing play-by-plays, kind of like we do for oh, oh, the boys, oh. but okay. they're complaining about it the whole time. Scene right. by scene. <laughs> oh, my word. Can we? I never thought of starting a haterade site. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> we don't need to get into that corner of the internet. <laughs> You're going to oh, attract no, no, the no, equal no, and opposite it. reaction. <laughs> One thing I hadn't thought about, and you just brought into my mind, was that the fact, would, do you see this as a succession of endless giants holding up the earth underneath the earth this way? Yes, exactly. The structure okay. of the earth is endless tunnels like this with these giants holding up. Holding it up. And the roof is made of these ribs and flesh, and wow. it's almost like a living entity. Okay. Wild. Yeah. It's a little bit reminiscent of the second Guardians of the Galaxy where they went inside. The planet was Ego. Right. So they go to that planet and then they find out that the actual planet is the Celestial. Dude, I'm curious here. I'm going to bring up a D&D. &D. Did you ever play any of the old SSI games, Strategic Simulations Incorporated? This is old 286 PC. No, 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 no. Okay. Do you know what I'm talking about, though? SSI rings a bell, but okay. I can't recall any of their games off the top this of my was, head. This company, this was my introduction to true D&D. I didn't have friends that were, lived close that played it, in all honesty. So I played it on computer first back in the 1988 to 89 era, I think. And they introduced four modules to D&D &D where you carried your character through four adventures, through four modules. And then they had some other ones that were part of some other realms. I don't know. I only know really old school, traditional, basic D&D. &D. But one of these adventures took place on the body of a god. And this is just now popping back into my mind right now. But it's so big. I mean, you just see it from the ground point of view. It just looks like ground. Kind mm -hmm. of. But it's like, I'm kind of curious if that's how this world is. <laughs> Well, yeah, burn is yeah, burn is an entity. The Earth, yeah. Okay, is the chaining negative for burns? We'll come to this. Let's we'll come to this later. I Sorry. imagine so. Yeah, we'll come back to that. Twisting Quick Ben's gaze traveled the opposite length of the cavern. More servants. He saw four, possibly five of them, each one reaching up to the ceiling. 
The cavern was, in fact, a vast tunnel curving in the distance. He thought, I am indeed within Burn, the sleeping goddess, a living warren, flesh and bone, and these servants. He called up to the creature, You have my gratitude. A flattened, misshapen head tilted down. Diamond eyes stared like descending stars. In a childlike voice filled with despair, it pleaded, Help us. Quick Ben gaped. He thought, help? The creature moaned. She weakens. Mother weakens. We die. Help us. Quick Ben asked, how? The creature repeated, help us, please. Quick Ben said, I, I don't know how. The creature said, help. Quick Ben staggered upright. The clay flesh he now saw was melting, running in wet streams down the giant's thick arms. Chunks of diamond fell away. He thought, the crippled gods killing them, poisoning Burn's flesh. Quick Ben's thoughts raced. He shouted, Servant, child of Burn, how much time? Until it is too late. The creature replied, Not long. It nears. The moment nears. Panic gripped Quick Ben. He asked, How close? Can you be more specific? I need to know what I can work with, friend. Please try. The creature said, Very soon. Tens. Tens of years, no more. The moment nears. Help us. Quick Ben sighed. For such powers, it seemed, centuries were as but days. Even so, the enormity of the servant's plea threatened to overwhelm him, as did the threat. He thought, what would happen if Burn dies? Beru Fend, I don't think I want to find out. All right, then. It's my war now. Mm -hmm. What an ally to pick up in this war. Absolutely. <laughs> for someone to say, it's my war you now. Need the Schwarzenegger, That's... You need the Schwarzenegger moment for, for quick man. <laughs> That's my war right now. <laughs> no, I don't want to equate those two together. <laughs> no, it's, no, uh, but you know what I'm saying. We just need that moment in the film where it's like, it's my war now. Uh, Got one tear almost coming down the eye, real teary eyed, you know. <clears throat> he glanced down at the mud strewn ground around him, questing with his senses. He quickly found the tracker. He shouted, Servant, I will leave something here so that I may find you again. I will help, I promise, and I will come back to you. The giant said, Not me. I die. Another will come. Perhaps. The creature's arms had thinned, were now almost devoid of their diamond armor. It said, I die now. It began to sag. The red stain in the ceiling had spread to the ribs it held, and cracks had begun to show. Quick Ben whispered, I will find an answer. I swear it. He gestured, and a warren opened. Without a last glance, lest the vision break his heart, he stepped within and was gone. That's a powerful scene right there. I wonder if the Ascendants would still chain the crippled god in place if they knew what would happen to Burn in the long run. Back to my question. So, and we, I, where I asked if you thought it was a similar situation with Burn, because I never thought about this before. I, for some reason, I had this, I didn't see it as a chaining. I just saw it more as, you know, she was sleeping. And I don't know if that's a chaining or a sleep. That's not what I'm saying. No, 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 no. Okay. The chaining is the crippled god. Oh. So... Would they have chained the crippled god to burn knowing what would happen? Right. That's a good question. Hmm. Because what do you do with this alien god that was pulled down and ripped apart? When they chain, do they go to the individual places that it fell? Or did it all fall in roughly the same vicinity? No, it went all over the place. It's kind of what I was thinking, too, about half the earth, right? About the exposed side of the earth, something falling from space. I'm not sure how widely it fell, but it's definitely on multiple continents. Okay, so the chaining, yeah, I guess it keeps it kind of, I don't even know how that works. They use words that I understand, like chaining. Okay, it's, it's chained down. So physically, its pieces are locked in place. And spiritually, this thing is, has built up enough power to create. To, I'm assuming that where Ben found the crippled god, he said the war was similar or familiar but twisted. I'm assuming it was Burns' realm, right? Was that what you would think? Just a piece of it he's absconded with yeah because when he was mm -hmm. scrabbling with his hands the blood was welling up and yeah. he apologized to burn yeah yeah okay that yeah so, so he's yeah he's just using a piece he's using a corner of it for his own purpose a hand shook his shoulder incessantly quick ben opened his eyes picker hissed damn you mage it's almost dawn we have to fly groaning he unfolded his legs wincing with every move then he let picker keep him upright as she carried him to the waiting quarrel, she asked, Did you get it back? He asked, Get what back? Picker said, That pebble. Quick Ben said, No, we're in trouble, Picker. Picker said, We're always in trouble. Quick Ben said, No, I mean all of us. He dug in his heels, stared at her, and said, 
all of us. <laughs> Escalation alert. I love that. The entire planet is now at risk. This is a significant escalation from where we were previously. Yes. <laughs> yes. So tens of years. Tens of years. The previous threat levels were citywide, maybe continent-wide with a war, yes. a civil war brewing. Now we have gone planet-wide. Yeah, it's bad. But what do you think? Is it 20 to 30 or less? Tens of years could be anywhere from slightly over 10 to 90-something, right? That's, so, that's what I'm thinking, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? I interpreted it in the 20 to 30 area, relatively short range. Yeah, it's coming quick. That's what I'm thinking. The urgency from this thing is like, it's coming quick. <laughs> yeah. Better deal with it now. The sooner, the better. Yes. yes. It's, a, <laughs> it's only going to accelerate. Whatever Picker saw in his expression left her shaken. She said, all right, but now we've got to get moving. He said, I, you'd better strap me in. I won't be able to stay awake. They came to the coral. The Maranth seated in the forward chitinous saddle swung its helmed head to regard them in silence. As she secured Quick Ben in the saddle, Picker muttered, Queen of Dreams, I ain't never seen you this scared, wizard. You got me ready to piss ice cubes. <laughs> they were the last words of the night that Quick Ben remembered, but remember them he did. Ganoa's Perrin was plagued by images of drowning, but not in water. Drowning in darkness. <laughs> Man, okay, I gotta stop for a second. <laughs> There uh -oh. is a comedy troupe that did a little D and D skit. Oh, okay. I have it downloaded to my computer. It's pretty old. It's from before YouTube. Okay. Go I don't on. know where I found it. They played it on G4 TV a long time ago. If anybody okay. remembers when G4 TV was still around, when they start out playing, the DM is telling the guy, "You are in darkness," and the guy is trying to figure out what to do. He can't see anything, and he's like, <laughs> "I light a torch," you know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a hilarious clip. I'll have to see if I can find a link and put it in the description okay. of the episode. It's hilarious. Okay. They're semi making fun of D&D &D players, but it's fun. Sounds cool. They just hit me that he's drowning in darkness because okay. that's how you were, start off that whole I thought shit. You, I thought you were going to go Charlie Murphy. No. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do it. <laughs> but one of the best comedy skits of all time. <laughs> absolutely charlie murphy's hollywood stories oh rick all james. of them great good stuff <laughs> that would be taken to rick james. charlie murphy passed recently yes. i think it was uh, it's, it's just a couple a years ago yeah sad thing gano's parent was plagued by images of drowning but not in water drowning in darkness disorientated thrashing in panic in an unknown and unknowable place whenever he closed his eyes vertigo seized him knots tightening in his gut and it was as if he'd been stripped down to a child once again, terrified, uncomprehending, his soul twisting with pain. It sounds like Perrin has been having a wonderful time for the last two months. Drowning in darkness sounds a bit like sensory deprivation. Yeah, I had forgotten what a bad time he was having here, especially after coming to like him so much. I don't like seeing this. No, it doesn't get better as we start progressing through this chapter. Yes. Perrin left the barricade at the Divide, where the day's last traitors were still struggling through the press of Malazan guards, soldiers, and clerics. He'd done as Dujek had commanded, setting up his encampment across the throat of the pass. Taxation and wagon searches had yielded a substantial haul, although as the news spread, the takings were diminishing. It was a fine balance, keeping the tax at a level that the merchants could stomach, and allowing enough contraband through lest the chokehold turn to strangulation and travel between Darujistan and Pale dried up entirely. Perrin was managing, but just barely. Yet it was the least of his difficulties. Since the debacle at Darujistan, he had been feeling adrift, tossed this way and that by the chaotic transformation of Dujik and his renegade army. The Malazan's anchor had been cut away. Support structures had collapsed. The burden upon the officer corps had grown overwhelming. Almost 10,000 soldiers had suddenly acquired an almost childlike need for reassurance. <laughs> yeah, when they put their trust in the leadership of the army, once the empire is gone, it all falls on the officers to hold it together. I can see how this would be incredibly stressful to those officers. Yeah. Add that to the recurring drowning feeling, and you have a recipe for trouble here. And I cannot imagine the stress, and part of what I forget is also the fact that the average soldier who has failing, like all of a sudden, wait a minute, are we outlawed? <laughs> you 
you know, kind of hanging out. It's like, that's got to be stressful. That is stressful. The soldiers were probably asking for it a bit if they found out any of the information, if any of it trickled down to them about what was going on. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know I'm what I mean? Sure, yes. Oh, I'm sure that would be, that's the case. But, but wondering where your money comes from when you're used to having an empire is a valid concern that was, would, even if they wanted to go renegade, it's like, well, how are we going to make money? <laughs> true how do you make money when you are when you it's like being on a traveling band with you gotta be you gotta live off the tour because the company's not paying for it you gotta pay for it yourselves <laughs> mm -hmm. reassurance was something perrin was unable to give the soldiers if anything the turmoil within him had deepened threads of bestial blood coursed his veins fragmented memories few of them his own and strange unearthly visions plagued his nights daylight hours passed in a confused haze endless problems of materiel and logistics to deal with the needs of management pushed again and again through the rising flood of physical maladies now besetting him he'd been feeling ill for weeks and perrin had his suspicions as to the source he thought the blood of the hound of shadow a creature that plunged into dark's own realm yet can i be sure of this the emotions frothing this crest more like a child's a child's is he a werewolf <laughs> Sorry, I'm sorry. Lycanthropy <laughs> is nothing to joke about, sir. You are correct, sir. Cue the music. <laughs> I'm sorry. I had any flashbacks from American Werewolf in London. Mm -hmm. Speaking of D&D, &D, were rats are particularly terrifying. Oh my good gracious. The Caverns and Creatures books that I keep talking about, which is the comedic mm -hmm. take on Dungeons and Dragons. Those people, they invite some dungeon master over they're making fun of him he shows up with a cape and he's he's kind of a neck beard he's wearing shorts and you know right. what you would expect uh, the stereotypical <laughs> D, D person that the public imagines i'm not it's saying everybody that plays D, D is like that no, i'm just no. saying what the stereotype we love D, &D. Is. we love D, D on this channel yeah i'm a nerd moving on so the guy shows up they're making fun of him so he gets out these magic dice when they roll them they're turned into their characters in his world okay <laughs> they encounter some were rats at some point it's a terrible thing to think if you get bit or scratched you could turn into one of them so it's highly contagious it's not something you want to mess around with <laughs> i would imagine not okay okay moving along but back to your point it is shockingly similar to being possessed by you know the coming of the moon werewolf drive is very similar yeah very much he pushed the thought away once more, knowing full well it would soon return, even as the pain in his stomach flared once again. And with another glance up to where Trotz held sentinel position, he continued making his way up the hillside. The pain of illness had changed him. He could see that within himself. He felt as if his own soul had been reduced into something piteous, a bedraggled, sweat-smeared rat trapped within a rockfall, twisting and squirming through cracks in a desperate search for a place where the pressure, the vast shifting weight, relented he thought a space in which to breathe and the pain all around me those sharp stones are settling still settling the spaces between them vanishing darkness rising like water whatever triumphs had been achieved in Darujistan now seemed trivial to perrin saving a city saving the lives of whiskey jack and his squad the shattering of lacine's plans they had one and all crumbled into ash in his mind he was not as he had been and this new shaping was not to his liking Pain darkened the world, pain dislocated, turned one's own flesh and bones into a stranger's house from which no escape seemed possible. Real quick, he's talking about pain here and mm -hmm. think about that from the crippled God's perspective. Well, that's true. An eternity of pain that he's experiencing. Yeah. And Perrin's been feeling it for two months. Yeah. 200,000 plus years for the old crippled God. <laughs> mm-hmm. Perrin thought, bestial blood, it whispers of freedom. Whispers of a way out, but not from the darkness. No, into that darkness, where the hounds went, deep into the heart of Anamander Rake's cursed sword, the secret heart of Dragnapur. He almost cursed aloud at that thought, as he worked his way along the hillside trail overlooking the divide. Day's light was fading. The wind combing the grasses had begun to fall away, the rasping voice retreating to a murmur. The blood's whisper was but one of many, each demanding his attention, each offering contradictory invitations, disparate paths of escape. He thought, but always escape, flight. This cowering creature can think of nothing else, even as the burdens settle and settle. Dislocation, 
All I see around me feels like someone else's memories. Grass woven on low hills, outcrops of bedrock studding the summits. And when the sun sets and the wind cools, the sweat on my face dries and darkness comes. And I drink its air as if it was the sweetest water. Gods, what does that mean? The confusion within him would not settle. He thought, I escaped the world of that sword, yet I feel its chains about me nonetheless, drawing ever tighter. And within that tension, there was an expectation of surrender, of yielding. An expectation to become what? Become what? Trot sat amidst high, tawny grasses on a summit overlooking the divide. The day's flow of traders had begun to ebb on both sides of the barricade. Others were setting up camps. The throat of the pass was turning into an unofficial wayside. If the situation remained as it was, the wayside would take root, become a hamlet, then a village. And then subsequently, the tax authorities would show up. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mr. <It's your> Taxman. <laughs> Perrin thought, but it won't happen. We're too restless for that. Dujex mapped out our immediate future, shrouded in the dust of any army on the march. Even worse, there are creases in that map, and it's starting to look like the bridge burners are about to fall into one, a deep one. Breathless and fighting yet more twinges, Perrin moved to crouch beside Trotz. He said, you've been strutting like a bull veteran since this morning, Trotz. What have you and Whiskey Jack brewed up, soldier? Trotz's thin, wide mouth twisted into something like a smile his dark eyes remaining fixed on the scene down in the valley. He growled, the cold darkness ends. Perrin said, to hood it does. The sun's moments from setting, you grease-smeared fool. Trotz continued, cold and frozen, blind to the world. I am the tail, and the tail has been unspoken for too long, but no longer. I am a sword about to leave its scabbard. I am iron, and in the day's light, I shall blind you all. Ha! Perrin spat into the grasses and said, Mallet mentioned your sudden loquaciousness. He also mentioned that it hasn't done anyone else any good, since with its arrival you've lost what little sense you showed before then. Truss thumped his chest, the sound reverberating like a drumbeat. He said, I am the tale, and soon it shall be told. You will see, Malazin, you all will. Perrin said, the sun's withered your brain, Trotz. Well, we're heading back to Pale tonight, though I'd imagine Whiskey Jack's already told you that. Here comes Hedge to relieve you as lookout. Perrin straightened, disguising the wince that came with the movement. He said, I'll just finish my rounds then. He trudged off. Perrin thought, damn you, Whiskey Jack. What have you and Dujek cooked up? The Panion Daman. Why are we sparing a mole's ass for some upstart zealots? These things burn out. Every time. They implode. The scroll scribblers take over. They always do. And start arguing obscure details of the faith. Sects form. Civil wars erupt. And there it is. Just one more dead flower trampled on history's endless road. Aye, it's all so bright and flushed right now. Only colors fade. They always do. One day, the Malazan Empire will come face to face with its own mortality. One day, dusk will fall on the Empire. He bent over as yet another knot of burning pain seized his stomach. He thought, no, think not of the Empire. Think not of Lacine's cull. Trust in Tavora, Gano's parent. Your sister will salvage the house. Better than you might have managed. Far better. Trust in your sister. The pain eased slightly. Drawing a deep breath, Perrin resumed making his way down to the crossing. He thought, drowning. By the abyss, I am drowning. To be constantly in this mental state would push anyone to the edge. Again, I cannot imagine how bad this would be. And he sounds like he needs to start a goth band to get this emotion out of him. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> He's so he's having such a hard time right now, and I, I feel so bad for Billy, the guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> I gotta tell you, no, no, this it gets better. I thought of making that joke, but I didn't. Oh. <laughs> we had the same thought. I was like, he sounds like an emo kid. I'm thinking of the sound of darkness. I'm drowning in darkness, but he is. But it's like, <laughs> but but the poor guy is. He's literally he's, drowning in darkness. Though. He's literally drowning. In he actually has a legitimate excuse to be emo, but I still it's like, good gracious, I forgot how bad this was. I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot that this is the book that does with him and this <laughs> emo parent. I'm like, oh my good gracious. Whew, okay. A lot of times when people are in this much pain like this, it's because they don't want to confront their problems. Yeah. And I'm not saying universally that's always the case, but in a lot of cases, especially for men, a lot of times this type of mental state comes from trying to avoid dealing with the issue yes agreed one thing i noticed in that last paragraph 
was he doesn't seem to know Tavora is the adjunct. He's thinking she's still going to salvage the house. He might mean the name. That's kind of how I take it. What? Parent of house parent per se, not necessarily, you know, like house of trade, still exists. It was briefly almost snuffed out, but it's still alive. You know what I'm saying? It's kind of like, I look at it like the, that way. And like, because they were part of the wealthy class in that society. So there is something, maybe they still have some assets that might possibly be there is worth saving or that they, you know, I don't know. That's kind of what I'm, I'm I may be stretching. <laughs> Do you think he knows that Tavora is the adjunct? I would hope so. Being that he's a captain in the, uh, it, technically he's a captain under D, under Dujek and those folks, and they're, uh, they're well informed. I would assume that, well, maybe they don't know. There's a possibility they don't know. Come on, you could be correct. Are they well informed if they don't have any communications with the Empire anymore? They're outlawed. Why would they have information about that? Because Dujek has a heck of an intelligence gathering system. Quick Ben is one of those agents. I would think he would be able to keep his ear. They know they're after the Pena Doman. I mean, that's it's it's a threat to everybody. Yeah, you know? I guess we'll have to, we shall see, sir. <laughs> yes, clambering like a rock ape, Hedge reached the summit. His bandy legs carried him to Trot's side. As he passed behind Trot's, he reached out and gave the warrior's single knotted braid a sharp tug. <laughs> he moved to sit beside Trot's and said, "Ha! I love the way your eyes bug out when I do that." Trot said, "You sapper are the scum beneath a pebble in a stream running through a field of sickly pigs." <laughs> <laughs> Ouch! <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it just gotta love the bridge burners and let the insults begin, sir. Yeah, I'm sorry you had me laughing with Hedge running up there like a rock ape. I couldn't get that image out of my mind. His bandy legs is too funny. Hedge said, "Good one, though a tad long-winded." Got the captain's head spinning, have you? Trot said nothing. His gaze now on the distant Talon Mountains. Hedge pulled his scorched leather cap from his head, scratched vigorously through the few remaining wisps of hair on his pate, studied his companion for a long moment. He said, not bad, noble and mysterious. I'm impressed. Trot said, you should be. Such poses are not easy to hold, you know. <laughs> Hedge said, you're a natural. So why are you twisting Perrin around? Trot's grinned, revealing a blue stained row of filed teeth. He said, it is fun. Besides, it's up to Whiskey Jack to explain things. Hedge said, only he ain't done any explaining yet. Dujek wants us back in pale, gathering up what's left of the bridge burners. Parents should be happy he's getting a company to command again, instead of just a couple of beat up squads. Did Whiskey Jack say anything about the upcoming parlay with Brood? Trot slowly nodded. Hedge scowled, well, what? Trot said, it is coming up. Hedge <laughs> said, oh, thanks for that. By the way, you're officially relieved of this post, soldier. They're cooking up a veteran carcass for you down there. I had the cook stuff it with dung since that's how you like it. Trots rose and said, one day I may cook and eat you, sapper. Hedge retorted and choked to death on my lucky bone. Trots frowned. He said, my offer was true, Hedge, to honor you, my friend. Hedge squinted up at Trots, then grinned. Bastard, you almost had me there. Sniffing, Trots turned away. He said, almost. Ha ha. Man, their banter is great. Their banter is great, but I do think Trots wants to eat Hedge. I think he does too. In honor of him. That wouldn't surprise me because that's why those tribes that do eat people, was it in New Guinea? Mm -hmm. They do it to honor them. It's not for sustenance. It's no. when a family member dies or something like that. It's never done for sustenance. The way that I understand cannibalism as a general rule of thumb as far as ritual and all that stuff is it's almost always done as ritual and, you know, not for sustenance. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the old Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> the ad for the new Royal Navy, far less acts of cannibalism this year than in previous years. And it's like, this, year. <laughs> this year. So, and as they're shooting this commercial, it's like they're in it, they're kind of shooting like in this hippie mode. So the guys are kind of longer haired, you know, and chill like it's a vacation is what they're trying to present this. But as they're doing this, there's a guy wandering through the scene with a human leg. <laughs> in his hand, you know, they got to put that leg down. <laughs> That's crazy. I'm sorry, you can move along now. Sorry. Whiskey Jack was waiting when Perrin returned to the trader post and its makeshift barricade. Once Sergeant, now Dujek one arm second in command, Whiskey Jack had come in with the last flight of Maranth. He stood with his old squad's healer, Mallet, the two of them watching a score of soldiers from the second army loading the past week's toll onto the quarrels. Perrin approached, walking cautiously so as to hide the pain within him. He asked, how fares the leg, Commander? Whiskey Jack shrugged. 
Mallet said, We were just discussing that. It's healed badly. Needs serious attention. Whiskey Jack growled, Later. Captain Perrin, have the squads assembled in two bells. Have you decided what to do with what's left of the ninth? Perrin said, Aye. They'll join what's left of Sergeant Ancy's squad. Whiskey Jack frowned and said, Give me some names. Perrin said, Ancy's got Corporal Picker and, let's see, Spindle, Blend, Deteran. So with Mallet here and Hedge, Trots and Quick Ben, Whiskey Jack said, Quick Ben and Spindle are now cadre mages, Captain, but you'll have them with your company in any case. Otherwise, I'd guess Ancy will be happy enough. Mallet snorted. Happy? Ancy don't know the meaning of the word. Perrin's eyes narrowed. He said, I take it then that the bridge burners won't be marching with the rest of the host. Whiskey Jack said, no, you won't be. We'll go into that back at Pale, though. Whiskey Jack's flat gray eyes steadied Perrin for a moment, then slid away. He said, there's 38 bridge burners left, not much of a company. If you prefer, Captain, you can decline the position. There's a few companies of elite Marines short on officers, and they're used to noblebornes commanding them. There was silence. Perrin turned away. Dusk was coming. He thought, I might take a knife in the back, is what he's telling me. Bridge burners have an abiding dislike for noble-born officers. A year ago, he would have spoken those words out loud, in the belief that bearing ugly truths was a good thing to do. The misguided notion that it was the soldier's way, when in fact it's the opposite, that is a soldier's way. In a world full of pitfalls and sinkholes, you dance the edges. Only fools jump feet first, and fools don't live long besides. On that note about the soldiers dancing the edges, Mm -hmm. he learned that lesson when he was camping out with Call, didn't he? Yes. I believe so. I think that's where he grew up a little bit more in that interaction with Call. Right. Perrin had felt knives enter his body once. Wounds that should have been fatal. The memory sheathed him in sweat. The threat was not something he could simply shrug off in a display of youthful, ignorant bravado. He knew that, and the two men facing him knew it as well. Perrin said, I still would consider it an honor to command the bridge burners, sir. Perhaps in time, I might have the opportunity to prove myself worthy of such soldiers. Whiskey Jack grunted, as you like, Captain. The offer remains open if you change your mind. Perrin faced him. Whiskey Jack grinned and said, for a little while longer anyway. A huge dark-skinned figure emerged from the gloom, her weapons and armor softly clinking. Seeing both Whiskey Jack and Perrin, the woman hesitated. Then fixing her gaze on Whiskey Jack, she said, the watch is being turned over, sir. We're all coming in, as ordered. Whiskey Jack rumbled, Why are you telling me, soldier? You talk to your immediate superior. The woman scowled, pivoted to face Perrin, and said, The watch. Perrin interrupted, I heard, Detaran. <laughs> Have the bridge burners get their gear and assemble in the compound. That got me pretty good when I read it. I bet she was going to repeat the exact same sentence verbatim. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Follows orders well, does she? At least in front of the superiors. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was good. Detteran said, it's still a bell and a half before we leave. Perrin said, I'm aware of that, soldier. Detteran said, yes, sir. At once, sir. The woman ambled off. Whiskey Jack sighed, about that offer. Perrin said, my tutor was Nappin. I've yet to meet a Nappin who knows the meaning of respect, and Detteran's no exception. I'm also aware that she's no exception as far as the bridge burners go either. Whiskey Jack muttered, it seems your tutor taught you well. Perrin frowned and asked, what do you mean? Whiskey Jack said, his disrespect for authorities rubbed off, Captain. You just interrupted your commander. (laughs) Great start for Perrin. Yeah, good job. Perrin said, "Uh, my apologies. I keep forgetting you're not a sergeant anymore. Whiskey Jack said, so do I, which is why I need people like you to get it right. He turned to Mallet and said, remember what I said, healer? Mallet said, aye, sir. Whiskey Jack glanced once more at Perrin and said, the hurry up and wait was a good touch, Captain. Soldiers love to stew. Perrin watched the man head off toward the gatehouse, then said to Mallet, Your private discussion with the commander healer. Anything I should know? Mallet's blink was sleepy. He said, No, sir. Perrin said, Very well. You may rejoin your squad. Mallet said, Yes, sir. When he was alone, Perrin sighed. He thought, 38 bitter, resentful veterans, already twice betrayed. I wasn't part of the treachery at the Siege of Pale, and Lacine's proclamation of outlawry embraced me as much as it did them. Neither event can be laid at my feet, yet they're doing it anyway. I feel bad for him being saddled with the title of nobleborn, even though he's doing his best to break that mold. You know, I have felt that the crew doesn't view him this way. It was the way I felt about this, because at least by the end of Gardens of the Moon, you know, he was part of the tight boy, like Quick Ben and Kalam, the, the guys that are the upper echelons in my mind of the Bridge Burners. Those guys seem to like him okay. 
So I just kind of assumed that extended downward to the remaining ones left, thinking, well, you know, he, he must have earned their respect. So that was my impression, but I guess not. Do you think that it's because the absence of Kalam, I, well, I guess Fiddler and Kalam are the only two that are truly absent. Quick Ben's here. Yeah. Mallet's here. Yeah. Yeah, theoretically, I did get the feeling by the end of Gardens of the Moon, some of them had come around to the idea that he was worth something. Yeah, because he was around, I know he was at least around Hedge, you know, because Hedge and Fit are tight, so I know he was around those two for sure. So we got Hedge here, so I thought at least Hedge would back that play and wouldn't want, and Trotz was also around, and Picker. So uh, he, these are people that we had met, so I would have thought they had been around them, that they would have no problem with him. But that's still only five or six compared to the <laughs> to the other thirty three that are that we don't know off of the off of the side that may be waiting to you know hold a grudge. Yeah, Perrin rubbed at his eyes. Sleep had become an unwelcome thing. Night after night, ever since their flight from Darujistan, he thought pain and dreams. No nightmares. Gods below. He spent the dark hours twisted beneath his blankets, his blood racing through him, acids bubbling in his stomach. And when consciousness finally slipped from him, his sleep was fitful, racked with dreams of running. He thought, running on all fours, then drowning. It's the blood of the hound, coursing undiminished within me. It must be. He had tried to tell himself more than once that the shadow hound's blood was also the source of his paranoia. He gave a sour grin as he thought, untrue. What I fear is all too real. Worse, this vast sense of loss without the ability to trust anyone. Without that, what do I see in the life awaiting me? Not but solitude, and thus nothing of value. And now all these voices, whispering of escape, escape. He shook himself, spat to clear the sour phlegm in his throat. He thought, think of that other thing, that other scene. Solitary, baffling. Remember, Perrin, the voice you heard. It was Tattersales. You did not doubt it then. Why do so now? She lives. Somehow, some way, the sorceress lives. Ah, the pain! A child screaming in darkness, a hound howling lost in sorrow, a soul nailed to the heart of a wound, and I think myself alone. Gods, I wish I were. This guy's messed up. He's got some problems. He is messed up. This poor guy, when you think about it, has double traveled. He's done the inception, hasn't he? Has he done the worn within a worn? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Okay. Whiskey Jack entered the gatehouse, closed the door behind him, and strode over to the scribe's table. He leaned against it, stretched out his aching leg. His sigh was like the easing of endless knots, and when it was done, he was trembling. After a moment, the door opened. Straightening, Whiskey Jack scowled at Mallet. He said, I thought your captain called for an assembly healer. Mallet said, Perrin's in worse shape than even you, sir. Whiskey Jack said, We've covered this. Guard the lad's back. You having second thoughts, Mallet? Mallet said, You misunderstand. I just quested in his direction. My Danul Warren recoiled, Commander. That's a bad sign. Yeah, ouch. Yeah, that's a really bad sign. Whiskey Jack only now noted the pallid cast of Mallet's round face. He asked, recoiled? Mallet said, aye. That's never happened before. The captain's sick. Whiskey Jack said, tumors? Cancers? Be specific, damn it. Mallet said, nothing like that, sir. Not yet, but they'll come. He's eaten a hole in his own gut. All that he's holding in, I guess. But there's more. We need Quick Ben. Perrin's got sorceries running through him like fireweed roots. Whiskey Jack said, Opon? Mallet interrupted, No. The twin jesters are long gone. Perrin's journey to Darujistan. Something happened to him on the way. No, not something. Lots of things. Anyway, he's fighting those sorceries, and that's what's killing him. I could be wrong in that, sir. We need Quick Ben. Whiskey Jack said, I hear you. Get him on it when we get to Pale. But make sure he's subtle. No point in adding to the captain's unease. Mallet's frown deepened. He said, sir, it's just, is he in any shape to take command of the bridge burners? Whiskey Jack said, you're asking me? If you want to talk to Dujek about your concerns, that's your prerogative, healer. If you think Perrin's unfit for duty, do you, Mallet? After a long moment, Mallet sighed, not yet, I suppose. He's as stubborn as you are, sir. Hood, you sure you two aren't related? Whiskey Jack growled, damn sure. Your average camp dog has purer blood than what's in my family line. Let it rest for now, then. Talk to Quick and Spindle. See what you can find out about those hidden sorceries. If gods are plucking Perrin's strings again, I want to know who. And then we can mull on why. Malice's eyes thinned as he studied Whiskey Jack. He asked, sir, what are we heading into? Whiskey Jack grimaced and said, I'm not sure, healer. 
Grunting, he shifted his weight off his bad leg and said, With Opon's luck, I won't have to pull a sword. Commanders usually don't, do they? Mallet said, If you gave me the time, sir. Whiskey Jack said, Later, Mallet. Right now, I've got a parlay to think about. Brood and his armies arrived outside pale. Mallet said, Aye. Whiskey Jack said, And your captain's probably wondering where in Hood's name you've disappeared to. Get out of here, Mallet. I'll see you again after the parlay. Mallet said, Yes, sir. And thus the chapter ends. <laughs> Good check. Oh, yeah. For standout moments, quick Ben attacking the crippled <laughs> god. The sheer audacity of this action boggles the mind. Yeah, I agree. It's so cool, so mind-boggling. And the fact that it just all this stuff is what makes us love Ben. He's as vicious physically almost as Kalam is, I mean, in this spiritual form. <laughs> right for the eyes. It's like, dude, all right. He knows what's what. He knows what's what. Nice. <laughs> Then, seeing how powerful the crippled god is in his mangled, sickly state was pretty impressive. Right. It is. And looking like he's already, you know, from what we've seen at the beginning with Minug, he's got his hands in the several other pies already, building a little network here, you know, doing something. Mm-hmm. Curious to see what's going to happen with those cards. Yeah. The scene within Burn with the giants crumbling due to the sickness imparted on Burn by the crippled god. Core memory. Absolute. Agreed. I, not much more to add other than, yes, core memory, baby. Really, really core memory. The escalation of Burn being at risk, and by extension, every being residing on the planet. Oh, yeah. And I just want to know so much more about Burn. <laughs> Why don't we call the world Burn? I mean, if they're, if Burn is the goddess of the earth, why is no one calling this planet Burn? I don't know. That's what I'm thinking. I particularly enjoyed the banter between Hedge and Trots. <sighs> I'm so glad to have a team of expert sarcastic wits. Now it's going to get fun. Trash talkers. Yes, expert trash talkers, yes. <laughs> We've got a handful on this one. <laughs> seeing Perrin's turmoil between the stress of leadership and the madness brought on by being linked to the hounds of shadow he freed he's in a tight spot right now yeah and as i kind of hinted at and alluded to as we were talking about earlier you know this is hard to see because you know last time we saw Perrin, you know he was kind of i felt like he's kind of starting to get control of the bridge burners all seemed well for the most part and i really hate seeing him hurt like this it's because we've come to really enjoy his character so much more at least i've come to enjoy him much much more in the earlier books i've always liked him in later but i really liked him so much more in our read of gardens and seeing him like this is hard to see agreed finding out that mallets warren recoiled from perrin and realizing just how sick he is that's pretty wild yeah is it sickness or is it something other <laughs> yeah maybe sickness isn't the right way to describe it something is wrong with him yes he is corrupted in some way. Especially because to scare off that is pretty wild. That because I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know it was possible to make something recoil like that or a healing warrant or something like that. Right. All right. Great job tonight, Billy. Hey, great episode, man. Great episode. You got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Other than the great episode, I just hate to leave Perrin hurting like this. <laughs> While we yeah. wait till the next, until we get back to him, it's hard. Yeah. I don't like seeing him in this state. Yeah. Mm. All right, thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. Hey, we'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us, and we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com.